Jesus Christ died, we died with him. Though he slays me, yet will I trust in him. Good morning. I'd like to welcome you this morning to Berean Bible Church, and I'd like to ask you to pray for my voice. Uh, that I'd be able to make it through this. I'm excited this morning. We're beginning a study on the Gospel of John. I'm sure it'll last at least a couple years, maybe longer. I don't really know, um, but I'm really excited about it. I think it's gonna. I think it's gonna be a learning experience for all of us. And I just pray, ask that you would be praying for me as I'm going through this, studying it. That uh, we would, uh, the Lord would teach us some new stuff. You know, I think it, it would be hard to overestimate the influence of the fourth gospel on the history of the church. I mean, I know whenever anybody, you're witnessing to somebody, I always tell them, read the gospel of John. Read the gospel of John. I mean, you hear that over and over. And theologians have found in the elevated Christology of the fourth gospel one of the highest and fullest expressions of Yesh- who Yeshua is in the entire Bible. It really lifts up the Lord Yeshua as Yahweh. I think any Bible student who has taken more than a superficial glance at the fourth gospel realizes it's filled with language and metaphor and imagery that grips the readers and literally transports them back to the world of the author. And we're going to be doing that a lot in this. We're going to be going back to their world to try to understand why this gospel was written. Someone once compared the fourth gospel to a pool of water. Very shallow around the edges that a little child could wade in and play, yet very deep in the center so an elephant could swim in it. And I think that's a, an appropriate analogy because the fourth gospel is easy to understand at the surface. I mean, there's so many things that, that are so clear and so obvious. But it has depth to it that scholars who have spent their entire lives studying it have not fully exhausted. And for our time this morning, I want to focus on the subject of authorship. That's what we're going to talk about this book. And then next week we'll go into when was it written, what is the purpose of it, the theme of the book. In the popular view, the author of the fourth gospel is normally viewed as the aging apostle John. But it's important to remember that nowhere in the gospel is the author state his name. And everybody believes, well of course, look at it, it says right there, John, right? So we know, well, that's not part of the text, okay? That's a title that someone put on there afterwards to help us. But this has such widespread and thorough discussion in scholarly circles about who this author might be. And there's not a lot of agreement. I mean, some people would say it's a pseudepigrapha writing, which I find that hard to believe because pseudepigrapha is what? It's falsely named writings. There's no name on this, so how could it be falsely named? I mean, it's kind of silly. You know, you got a pseudepigrapha with no name attached to it. Doesn't give it a lot of strength there. According to church tradition, probably the strongest tradition, John wrote the fourth gospel. Now, there are various church fathers in the second century that taught that the apostle John, the son of Zebedee, was the author. And there's an increasing urgency about this conclusion for the mainstream church after about the middle of the second century because the fourth gospel seems to have been a favorite among the Gnostics. And therefore, apostolic authorship was deemed important if the gospel would be rescued from heterodox. So they had to just, let's stick an important name on here. Let's stick John. He's an apostle. That gives this, you know, some power. And I've heard people say, well, you know, if, if John is not the author, and if Lazarus is the author of this book, then that goes against inspiration. I'm like, how? Are all the writers of the New Testament apostles? No. So why does it have to be the Apostle John or it's not inspired? God wrote this book, okay? Now, he used a human author, and we'll talk about him. Irenaeus, around 180, stressed that this gospel was written in Ephesus by one of the twelve, John. I hope to prove to you this morning that's not true, okay? (laughs) But this wasn't the conclusion of the early witnesses. You know, Papias of Hierapolis ascribed this gospel to an elder John whom he discusses um, from another John. And, you know, so some were saying it's John the Elder, some were saying it's John the Apostle. You know, there's just a lot of different ideas about who wrote this. But for the most part, tradition says that John wrote the fourth gospel. Although there's some difference of opinion as to what John, 
Most people believe that without question. After all, like I said, the title in the Bibles, it says John, the Gospel according to John. So, you know, we know that. We know John wrote it, right? So when I read chapter 1, I mean chapter 21, that the writer of this Gospel says he's the disciple whom Yeshua loved, I automatically think, well, John is the disciple whom Yeshua loved. But that really doesn't bear witness with the text. And we have to examine everything by the text. You know, when you're looking at authorship, a lot of people look at external evidence. Then they look at internal evidence. You know, there's a lot of different evidences, but I think people, we have to look at internal evidence, first of all, foremost. What does the scripture say? Because that's the most important thing, right? There's a lot of external evidences on different things. We want to know, does the Bible tell us something? And when it tells us something, that's what we need to go with. The beliefs you hold to need to come from the text itself. And there's quite often a difference between what people say the Bible says and what it actually says. I'm sure you realize that. The Brians were praised for checking out Paul's teaching. So if they were checking out Paul's teaching, how much do we need to test everything we're taught? He was an apostle. If everybody thinks something is true, that doesn't make it true. All right? So we need to be open to allowing the biblical text to shatter false ideas we might have. And this morning, that means shattering our false idea that John wrote the gospel. And this is not a message you just hear and grab it. I think you need to go back to the notes. The notes will be up on the website. You need to look through this. You need to examine the scriptures yourself and compare them with one another. You know, if you don't know who wrote a letter, it's hard to understand what's being talked about. When I get a letter, that's the first thing I do. You know, we do it backwards. We put the whoever wrote it at the, bo- at the bottom. So I read this whole letter, and I have no clue who's talking to me. I get to the bottom, oh, it's so-and-so. Now that makes sense. You know, put the name at the top, you know, and then you understand. Because have you ever read something you thought somebody wrote, and they didn't write it, and you're like totally confused on why they're saying that? If you don't know who the author is, you can get confused. And I think that's what we see in this fourth gospel. This gospel is so different from the synoptics. So different. And I think the reason for that difference is its author was not a Galilean, John the Apostle, but a Judean, Lazarus. And this is what makes it so different from the rest. Now let's forget tradition for just a moment and let's look at the scriptures and let's see if we can determine who wrote the fourth gospel. And it's really not difficult because it tells us right in the book who wrote it. John 21, 20, Peter, turning around, saw the disciple whom Yeshua loved following them the one who had also leaned back on his breast at supper. And he said, Lord, who is the one who betrays you? Now here the writer mentions this disciple whom Yeshua loved, and then he states that this is the disciple who wrote the letter later on in the text. He says, this is the disciple who bears witness to these things and wrote these things, and we know that his witness is true. So the disciple whom Jesus loved, or Yeshua loved, is this disciple. The antecedent of this goes back to the disciple Yeshua loved in verse 20. So we know who wrote the gospel. It was the disciple who Yeshua loved. So now all we have to do is figure out who that was. Who did he love? And there's people who chime in, he loves everybody. Okay, well, everybody wrote the book, all right? No. Does the Bible say anywhere that John was the disciple that Yeshua loved? Some people think it, think it does, but I really don't see that when looking at the text. The Bible explicitly names someone who was loved by Yeshua. And there's only one man, only one man named in the Bible said to be loved by Yeshua. Now, if we agree that The disciple whom he loved wrote this, and there's only one person spoken of in Scripture who has specifically said that Yeshua loved. That might give us a little clue as to who wrote this thing. It says, now a certain man was sick, Lazarus of Bethany, the village of Mary, and her sister Martha. And it was the Mary who anointed the Lord with ointment and wiped his feet with her hair, whose brother Lazarus was sick. So here we see Lazarus. For the first time, we're introduced to him. Now, notice carefully what we're told about this man, Lazarus. John eleven three, 3. The sisters, therefore, sent to him, saying, Lord, behold, he who you love is sick. So Lazarus' sisters 
refer to him as a man who Yeshua loved. Well, that tells us something, I think, very important about Lazarus. But that's a sister's opinion, right? Even more revealing is what the Spirit tells us through the inspired text. Now, Yeshua loved Martha and her sisters and Lazarus. There it is. Yeshua loved Lazarus. So Lazarus' sister said Yeshua loved him. The text says Yeshua loved Lazarus. And notice verse 11 of chapter 11. This he said, and after that he said to them, Our friend Lazarus has fallen asleep, but I go that I may awaken him out of sleep. Now notice carefully, he is saying here, Our friend Lazarus. He calls Lazarus his friend. And notice what Yeshua said about his friends. Greater love has no one than this than he laid down his life for his friends. Laying down your life would imply love. So when Yeshua said that Lazarus was his friend, he was saying he loved Lazarus. And that's not all. Even the Jews said that Yeshua loved Lazarus. In 1136. And so the Jews were saying, behold how he loved him. You know, it seems to me that the Spirit of God is going to great lengths in John chapter 11 to make it known that Yeshua loved Lazarus. And as I said, Lazarus is the only man named in the Bible that is specifically identified as being loved by Yeshua. That's a major clue, I think. He's the only one. Now, before Pentecost... Only 15 verses mention Yeshua's love. Three of the verses reference Yeshua's love for Lazarus. Five others refer to the disciple who Yeshua loved. So the Bible only has seven more verses to, prior to Pentecost that overtly mention Yeshua's love. And not one of those verses names anyone. Only one verse, Mark 10.21, refers to a single individual, but he's not named. Because of this love, I think it should be obvious that Yeshua and Lazarus have known each other for a while. They have spent some time together. But the first we hear of Lazarus is in John 11. That's the first time we hear him by name, anyway. I think that we see Lazarus early in the Gospel, but he's not named. I believe that he was a disciple of John the Baptist. Now look at this text in John 1.35. Again, the next day, John was standing, that's John the Baptist, was standing with two of his disciples. And he looked upon Yeshua, and he walked and said, Behold, the Lamb of God. And the two disciples heard him speak, and they followed Yeshua. So here we have two of John's disciples leaving him to follow Yeshua. Well, who are they? Well, in, in verse 40 of chapter 1, it says, One of the two who heard John speak and followed him was Andrew, Simon Peter's brother. So he received that one of the disciples is Andrew. The other one's never named. Now, this would be consistent with the author's practice of not naming himself. It seems safe to assume that when the writer makes any reference to another unnamed disciple, he has in mind one particular disciple whom Yeshua loved. You know, it's hard to believe that the writer has a number of different disciples that he's committed to keeping anonymous. It just doesn't seem to make sense. Well, let's go back to John 11 where we see Yeshua raise Lazarus from the dead. 11.43. And when he had said these things, he cried out with a loud voice, Lazarus, come forth. And he who had died came forth, bound hand and foot with wrappings, and his face was wrapped around with a cloth. Keep that in your mind for a second. His face is wrapped with a cloth. He's, he gets, he's, comes out of this grave, and he's literally wrapped up like a mummy, okay? He's, he was dead, and he's wrapped. So they have to unwrap him, and Yeshua said to them, unbind him and let him go. Imagine standing there, you know, he's waiting to get these things off so he can see again and come back and be part of the world again. So we see that Lazarus, Yeshua's friend, the one he loved, had been raised from the dead. Now, people, that's an incredible miracle, especially if you're Lazarus, all right? They were good friends before Yeshua raised him from the dead, but now what do you think their friendship was like? You think their resurrection had a profound changing effect on Lazarus? I mean, can you imagine you're dead? And you come out of the tomb and you got all these wrapping clothing and people have to unwrap you and bring you, you know, and you're back there, back in the world again. I think being raised from the dead made Lazarus quite a celebrity. Everybody wanted to see him. We see that in the text in John 12, 9. The great multitude, therefore, of the Jews learned that he was there. And they came. Watch this. Not for Yeshua's sake only. The crowd's coming, not just for Yeshua, but that they might see also Lazarus 
who he raised from the dead. So he's a big celebrity now. They're coming to just, wow, you were dead now. You're not dead. That's really cool. They were not just gathering to see Yeshua. They wanted to see Lazarus. But the chief priest took counsel that they might put Lazarus to death also. Because on account of him, Lazarus, many of the Jews were going away and were believing in Yeshua. See, Lazarus is causing such a stir that the Jewish leadership wants him dead. From here, the text goes into the triumphal entry. And we learn something interesting here. The crowd was there because of Lazarus. And so the multitude who were with him, when he called Lazarus out of the tomb and raised him from the dead, were bearing him witness. For this cause, because of the resurrection of Lazarus, also the multitude went and met him because they heard that he had performed this sign. So he's a big celebrity. Everybody's talking about they wanted to see him. People are coming to faith because of this. But there's some that wanted to kill him. I think it's for this reason that the author of the fourth gospel wanted to remain anonymous. I don't think he wanted the celebrity, and I don't think he wanted to be killed again, you know? So he calls himself the disciple whom Yeshua loved, and he also calls himself the other disciple. We see those two throughout the book. Now I want you to notice something that I think is very significant. John 12 is the last time we hear of Lazarus. We meet him in chapter 11, he's gone in chapter 12. After 12, he disappears from Scripture. This good friend of Yeshua, this man whom Yeshua loved and raised from the dead, suddenly disappears. We see him last in 12, 1 and 2. Yeshua, therefore, six days before the Passover, came to Bethany where Lazarus was, whom Yeshua had raised from the dead. So they made him a supper there, and Martha was serving. But Lazarus was one of those reclining at the table with him. So Lazarus is, is reclining in the bosom of the Lord, enjoying the fellowship of the Lord together here. That's the last time we see him. Reclining at the table. Then he disappears. And what's really interesting, right after Lazarus' name disappears, someone else appears who we've never heard of before. In chapter 12, or chapter 13, verse 23. There was reclining on Yeshua's breast one of his disciples whom Yeshua loved. So the last time we see Lazarus, he's reclining at the table with Yeshua. The first time we see the disciple whom Yeshua loved is reclining at the table with Yeshua. The only man in the Bible as being named by Yeshua abruptly vanishes from the gospel. And then the only disciple singled out as being loved by Yeshua abruptly appears in the same gospel. And it's my contention that this disciple whom Yeshua loved is Lazarus. This seems so clear from the text, but we miss it because the title in the gospel says the gospel according to John. And we say, well, that's not Lazarus, so he couldn't have wrote it. So we assume that John the disciple wrote this. But the inspired text tells us Yeshua loved Lazarus. Now some will argue that only the twelve were at the Last Supper. And Lazarus was not one of the twelve, and he wasn't. Lazarus was not one of the twelve. But where did the idea come from that only Yeshua and the twelve were at the Last Supper? It comes from Da Vinci, okay? There you go. Now, culturally, there are so many things wrong with this picture, it isn't funny. Anybody see anything culturally wrong there? They're sitting in chairs. Okay, very good. They're sitting in chairs, all right? They're very Western. They're sitting in chairs. Yeah, they're all white people, okay? They're at a table, but they're sitting in chairs at a table the way we would. They're not reclining. Anybody else see anything wrong in there? See the windows in the back? It's light out. Okay? <laughs> now, look it. If you count them, there's, there's 13 people there. You got Yeshua and 12 disciples. So, we, you know, that's the only people that are there. But see, this proves that someone else was there. Who took the picture? <laughs> okay? You know, they all got behind the table. They didn't have selfie sticks back then. Okay? So they had to have somebody else out front taking a picture. I see this picture and I just laugh. I'm thinking, you know, what happened here? All you guys get on this side so we can get our picture taken. You know, I'm like, it's just kind of crazy, all right? But, you know, too often, we, that's where we get theology from, all right? We get it from pictures or movies. We don't get it from the book. Listen, the Scripture never tells us that Yeshua and the Twelve were alone at Passover. As a matter of fact, Yeshua and the Twelve were probably very rarely ever alone. Acts 1 tells us about a time when the 11 remaining apostles named a replacement for Judas. 
They began by selecting two men. But notice what is said about the group from the two, the two men came from. It is therefore necessary that of all the men who have accompanied us all the time that the Lord Yeshua went in and out among us. So this whole group, all the group that was following us along and being part of this, that's who we have to choose these new men from. So you got this greater group, many loyal disciples that accompanied him throughout his time here on earth. And it's hard to believe that some of them would not have been at the Lord's Supper. And something Yeshua says also indicated the presence of others at the Last Supper. Yeshua tells them that one of them will betray him. And when they ask him who, he replies, he said to them, it's one of the twelve, one who dips with me in the bowl. One of the twelve. There's only twelve there. Well, I say one of the twelve. Oh, I'm like, hello. Well, yeah, that's, you know, come on, really? It's one of the twelve? If you only got twelve, it's just one of you guys. All right, you don't need to say that. Look at Luke 6.13. This is an important distinction here. When the day came, he called his disciples to him, and he chose 12 of them. He's got a group, a whole bunch of disciples. He chooses 12 who he names as apostles. You've got to make this distinction, people. Disciple is a broad term. It refers to a follower of Yeshua. Apostle is a specific term referring to the 12. It's also designated that way. They're called the 12. All right. What's interesting is that the term apostle is never used in the fourth gospel. Now, the Greek word apostolos is used once in John 13, 16. It's referred to one who sent, but it's not, never used as a technical designation of the 12. Don't have that in John. But understand, you got disciples, then you got apostles. Now, some people say only the apostles were at the Lord's Supper. I don't believe that. I believe the disciples were always around. They were always following. Always part of this group. So if Yeshua and the twelve are the only ones there, as we said, it doesn't make much sense for him to say it's one of the twelve. But we learn from the text that the disciple whom Yeshua loved was not one of the twelve. Now, Lazarus wasn't part of that group. We know that. The next text in the fourth gospel that mentions the other disciple is uh, John 18. He says, So the Roman cohort and the commander and the officers of the Jews arrested Yeshua and bound him and led him to Annas first, for he was father-in-law of Caiaphas, who was the high priest that year. Now Caiaphas was the one who had advised the Jews that it was expedient for one man to die on behalf of the people. This is referring to the trial of Yeshua. He goes on, and Simon Peter was following Yeshua, and so was another disciple. All right, you get the context here? You got Peter, you got the other disciple. Now that disciple, that's the other disciple, that's Lazarus, who's the other disciple, was known to the high priest. And he entered with Yeshua into the court of the high priest. But Peter was standing at the door outside. Why? Peter couldn't get in there. Why? Because you had to be a priest to go in there. And see, Lazarus was a priest, and he knew these people, and so he got in. So the other disciple who was known to the high priest went out and spoke to the doorkeeper. He gets Peter in. He's got a contact. Let me, come on, let me go get Peter and bring him in here with us, all right? So we got a disciple here, this other disciple who is Lazarus. He's known to the high priest. He gets Peter in. Now, if you read John 20, you will see that the other disciple is the disciple whom Yeshua loved. In 20 verse 2, And so they ran and came to Simon Peter and to the other disciple whom Yeshua loved, and they said to them, They have taken away the Lord out of the tomb, and we do not know where they have laid him. All right, they took away the other disciple, the one whom Yeshua loved. That's this other disciple that you see in there. The other disciple, the disciple who Yeshua loved, Lazarus, they're all the same person. Now, if we compare John 18 to Acts 4, I think we see that the other disciple could not have been John. In Acts 4, 1 through 23, it tells us what happened to Peter and John following the healing of the crippled man. They were seized, they were brought before the rulers, the elders, the scribes, the Sanhedrin brought them in, Annas the high priest and Caiaphas, in order to question them about the miracle. It says, now as they observed the confidence of Peter and John and understood that they were uneducated, untrained men, they were marveling and they began to recognize them as having been with Yeshua. 
Notice here the Jewish leaders recognize it was at that moment they suddenly realized, well, these people were, they're followers of Yeshua. And the principal thing we need to get out of this passage is that it was at that point that the high priests and the other rulers became acquainted with Peter and John for the first time. But our text in John 18 tells us that the other disciple was known to the high priest. So that couldn't have been John. This other disciple cannot be John. The high priest didn't know John or Peter. They couldn't get in there. So the other disciple could not have been the Apostle John. Now, as the commercials on TV would say, but wait, there's more, all right? We see in John 20 that the other disciple was the first to believe after the resurrection. John 20, 8 and 9. So the other disciple, who had first come to the tomb, entered also. And he saw and believed. All right, they get to the tomb, he runs up, the tomb's empty, he sees it, he believes. For as yet, it says... They did not understand the scriptures that he must rise from the dead. Now, this happened very early the first day of the week. The other disciple, he saw the resurrection, he believed. But later that day, notice what Luke tells us, Luke 24, 33. And they arose that very hour and returned to Jerusalem and found gathered there 11 of those who were with them. All right, the they here is referring to the two disciples who met Yeshua on the road to Emmaus. They join the gathering with the eleven and the others that Yeshua, Yeshua shows up. Now notice what the text tells us about them. Verse 41, And while they still could not believe, they still couldn't believe, these eleven, for joy they were marveling, and he said to them, Have you anything here to eat? So the eleven, that's the twelve, that's the apostles minus Judas, they didn't believe in the afternoon, but the other disciple believed in the morning. So the other disciple was clearly not one of the twelve. Now, Yeshua's trial, there was only two disciples there with him, Peter and the other disciple. And Peter denies that he even knows him. Then they go to the cross, and none of the twelve were there. They were all afraid, but notice who was there. Therefore the soldiers did these things, but they were standing by the cross of Yeshua, his mother, his mother's sister, Mary, the wife of Clopas, and Mary Magdalene, when Yeshua therefore saw his mother and the disciple whom he loved standing there, he said to his mother, so he got the disciple whom he loved is there at the cross. He says, woman, behold your son. Then he said to the disciple, behold your mother. And from that hour, the disciple took her into his household. Now the synoptics say that all the twelve deserted Yeshua once he was taken away for execution. Even Peter and record only women being, at the, women being at the cross. But there's not a contradiction here, because the disciple whom Yeshua loved is Lazarus, rather than one of the twelve. And he's there. The only man that we know of who was at the cross there when Yeshua died was the disciple whom Yeshua loved. Why? What gave Lazarus boldness to be there at the crucifixion? Think about it. He'd been, ra he'd been dead already and raised from the dead. You think he's afraid of these people? What can you do to me? You know, this is the man who brings life. He gives life to the dead. So he was there with them. He understood what was going on. He knew the man who was the resurrection and the life. Well, Yeshua loved Lazarus, and he made him responsible to take care of his mother. This historical figure of Lazarus is more important, I think, than we may have previously imagined due to his role in the life of Yeshua and Yeshua's mother. Yeshua must have trusted him implicitly to hand over his mother to him when he died. Now, after hearing from the women that the tomb was empty, Peter runs to the tomb. And the parallel text in the synoptics, right, that's what you're going to see as we go through this. This gospel is very different than the synoptics, the first three, Matthew, Mark, and Luke. Ninety-three percent of the material in John is original, not found somewhere else. A lot of interesting stuff here. So after hearing about the woman, Peter takes off and he runs there. 24, Luke 24, 12. But Peter rose and ran to the tomb. Stooping and looking in, he saw the linen wrappings only, and he went away to his home, marveling at what had happened. Well, Luke makes it sound like it's just Peter, right? But we learn from the fourth gospel that Peter wasn't alone. Look at John 20, verse 2. And so she ran and came to Simon Peter and to the other disciple, there he is, whom Yeshua loved, 
And they said to him, they've taken away the Lord out of the tomb. We do not know where they have laid him. So Peter's there, and there's another disciple. Now Luke just mentions Peter, but here we have the other disciple. Verse 5, and the two were running together, and the other disciple ran ahead faster than Peter. And he came to the tomb first. And stooping and looking in, he saw the linen wrapping lying there, but he did not go in. All right, so the other disciple, Lazarus, gets there first, and he stops, and he sees what's going on in there, and he doesn't go in. When Peter gets there, what's he do? He runs right in. Impetuous Peter runs right in. What's happening here? What do you, why do you think Lazarus stopped there? I think the sight of the linen wrappings lying there brought back some real memories for him. So he just stopped. He is in awe. He is overcome. The sight would have affected him greatly. He understood the significance of these terms because he'd experienced wearing the linen cloths. I don't imagine that's a time he's going to eat very easily forget. Well, notice what else is specifically mentioned. Simon Peter, therefore, also came following him and entered the tomb, and he beheld the linen wrappings lying there, and the face cloth, which had been on his head, not lying with the linen wrappings, but rolled up in a place by itself. The Greek word for face cloth here, sumderion, as Lazarus is familiar with this face cloth because he wore one. In John eleven forty four, he who died came forth bound hand and foot with wrappings, and his face was wrapped around with a sudarion. Yeshua said to them, unbind him and let him go. It's not an accident the author of the book took the time to mention this seemingly trivial detail of the face cloth with regard to Lazarus also. Lazarus had worn the cloth on his own face. The sight of it in Yeshua's tomb would have caused him to believe. He came back from the dead, now Yeshua did. He believes it. Well, after the resurrection morning, the next mention of the disciple whom Yeshua loved occurs in John chapter 21, verse 2. There were together Simon Peter, Thomas called Didymus, Nathaniel of Canaan of Galilee, and the sons of Zebedee, and two other disciples. Okay, notice we got two other disciples. He doesn't name them. Just, he's naming these specific disciples, then he just doesn't name two of them. And that's kind of consistent with the author's practice of not naming himself. But he refers to himself in verse 7. Let's drop down to 7. He says, That disciple therefore whom Yeshua loved said to Peter, It's the Lord. And so when Simon Peter heard that was the Lord, he put on his outer garment, for he was stripped for work, and he threw himself into the sea. Since the disciple whom Yeshua loved was present, go back to two, verse 2 again. We got the sons of Zebedee there, and we got two other disciples. Sons of Zebedee are named one of which is John. And we know that the unnamed disciple whom Yeshua loved is present at the same time. I think this is strong evidence that the author was not the apostle of John. It wasn't John. John's named there, but there's another disciple also. Now, at the end of the fourth gospel, Yeshua is talking to Peter, and he tells him what kind of death he's going to experience. He says, now this he said signify by what kind of death he would glorify God. And when he had spoken this, he said to him, Follow me. Now, in response to this, Peter, turning around, saw the disciple whom Yeshua loved, Lazarus, following them, the one who also leaned back on the breast at the supper, and said, Lord, who is the one who betrays you? Peter, therefore, seeing him, said to Yeshua, Lord, what about this man? He's talking about death. He tells him, here's how you're going to die. Peter, as soon as he hears about death, he talks to Lazarus. What about him? The topic of death seems to bring Lazarus to mind. Why? Yeshua said to him, if I want him to remain until I come, what is that to you? You follow me. That's a preteristic verse. Yeshua is saying, if, you want, if I want Lazarus to stick around until I come back for a couple thousand years, that's okay. No, that doesn't fit at all in that context, you know. He goes on, this saying therefore went out among the brethren that the disciple would not die. Yet Yeshua didn't say he wouldn't die, but only if I want him to remain until I come. What is that to you? Something about this other disciple caused some of the disciples that were present at this group to jump to the conclusion that Yeshua said, if I want him to remain until I come. What's that, you know, that they, they took this as, he's not going to die. The rumor that this disciple wouldn't die didn't spring from a misunderstanding about what Yeshua said. I think the error happened because of who he was speaking to or about. 
I'm sure that Peter and the rest of the disciples knew this individual Lazarus who had already been with them. He was brought back from the dead. In this case, a reason for the disciples jumping to this conclusion. This guy was dead, and now he's back. So the conclusion, they said, hey, since Yeshua already raised him from the dead, he's not going to die anymore. That's how they mistakenly interpret He doesn't have to die again because he's already been raised from the dead. What about him? Well, i got to die. What's he going to do? I think you'd agree that the rising of Lazarus from the dead is a profound event in the life of Yeshua. Yet this remarkable miracle is missing from three of the four Gospels. The first three Gospels don't even hint at this miracle occurred. They never mention Yeshua had a friend named Lazarus that he loved. Now, considering that Matthew was probably eyewitness to that raising, and that certainly was a, a powerful experience, yet Matthew left this out when he wrote the gospel. Lazarus was big news, so why don't the other gospels mention any of this? Well, strangely enough, it turns out that there's another prominent figure in the life of Yeshua who was also nowhere to be found in the first three gospels. And that person is the disciple whom Yeshua loved. He's not mentioned in any of their Gospels, just like Lazarus. Is that a coincidence? Well, I think they left him out because they're both the same. So how did the fourth Gospel ever come to be attributed to John? I mean, we know there's misunderstanding, and some think it's John the Elder, some think it's John the Apostle, but how did this... Well, let me give you a, a little clue here. Uh, let me take a shot at this. Lazarus is the Greek rendering of the name Eleazar. And in a letter that Clement wrote to Theodore, all right, this is historical stuff, this is not biblical, but I think it's pretty important history. Clement wrote a letter to Theodore. He stated that there was more testimony attached to Mark than was presently available. In other words, Mark's gospel doesn't tell us everything. He says, within the original gospel was a discussion of a young man whose name was John Eliezer, Eliezer being the Hebrew of the Greek Lazarus. He says, there was a man, John Eliezer, whom after Yeshua raised from the tomb, went to the Garden of Gethsemane clothed in a fine white linen garment over his naked body. Now that's interesting stuff. And like I said, you know, it's just history. It's not inspired. But here we see in history that they're saying that there was a man whose name was Lazarus, John Eliezer, who Yeshua raised from the dead. So John did write the fourth gospel. John Eliezer, John Lazarus, not John the Apostle, not John the Elder. And here's what's interesting. Eliezer is a name found only in priestly lineages. And I believe, as I said, that Lazarus was a priest. As a priest, he would have been able to enter the Bet Din of the high priest there, while Peter, who was a layman, was required to stay outside. Let me give you several reasons why I believe that Lazarus was a Jewish priest. And these are also reasons why the Apostle John of Galilean probably did not write this book, all right? First of all, he knows the names of the high priest's servant, Malchemus. All the Gospels record Peter cutting off the high priest's servant ear. None of them mention his name. He seems to know it. Secondly, only the fourth Gospel records the name of the high priest, Annas. He knew the high priest by name. Thirdly, he was familiar with the family relationship of the high priest. Only in the fourth gospel we learn, do we learn that Annas was the father-in-law of Caiaphas. Lazarus is known to be, Lazarus is known to the palace household. Peter had to wait outside. Lazarus let right in. He could only have entered that way if he was a priest. He was acquainted with the relationship of the palace staff. Only the fourth gospel tells us that one of those who questioned Peter's association with Yeshua was a relative of Malchus. And finally, he was aware of the motives of the priests. Only the four, writer of the fourth gospel explains why the priests would not enter Pilate's judgment hall. It's my opinion, based on these facts, that Lazarus was a priest, and that is why he could enter the court of the high priest, and that's why he could get Peter in there also, this Lazarus was known as John Eliezer. It was this John who wrote this gospel, I believe. And I think the internal evidence is just overwhelming. At least it is to me. And I just challenge you to examine the evidence, look at these scriptures, compare scripture with scripture. But let me throw this out also. 
Let's just say that a man named John, not the son of Zebedee, could very well have edited this book and stuck his name on it. Although the beloved disciple is claimed as the source of the book, that doesn't necessarily mean that he's the actual writer of the book. Most scholars are in agreement that John 21 makes clear that while the beloved disciple is said to have written down some gospel traditions, he is no longer alive when at least the end of the chapters are written. Notice what it says. This is the disciple who bears witness to these things and wrote these things, and we know that his witness is true. That we know his witness is true is a dead giveaway that someone other than the disciple whom Yeshua loved put this gospel into its final form and added the appendix. So someone named John could have taken all the material that Lazarus put together and edited it and put it together like this. All right, that's another way they say that they came up with this idea that John was on there. But I think understanding that, that Lazarus was called John Eliezer makes a lot of sense to me. In my position at the time, my AT&T position at this time, is that the epistles, 1st, 2nd, 3rd John, Revelation, the Gospel, were all written by Lazarus, all right? They bear striking similarities, and I think that's because they were all written, or I believe they're all edited by the same man also, John the Elder. All right, and that's all I got for authorship, and next week we're going to come back and we're going to look at more of just an introduction here before we get to the text itself, because I want to give you a little background on this. I want you to give you some understanding. Now, listen, am I willing to die for the fact that Lazarus wrote this? No, because I know it was inspired of the Lord, all right? So the human author, I think understanding the human author is going to help us get some things out of this book that we might miss if we didn't understand that. But, again, we understand that inspiration is something that the Lord does, and he inspired this, whoever wrote it, he inspired him to write it. Let's pray. Father, I thank you this morning for the opportunity to look at your word. Lord, I pray you'd give us the hearts of Bereans, that we would take these things and dig, Lord. Just compare scripture with scripture. Just see if these things really are so, Lord. I thank you, Lord, for the day and age in which we live, that there is so much available to us to allow us to study and dig and learn things. Teach us, Lord, we pray. Amen.